All right, I think we'll get started. Um, uh, thank you everybody for coming on this would have been Dr. Du Bois 156th birthday, so a couple of years ago. Um, uh, my name is Brad McKenna. I'm the technology librarian here. And um, I would like to quick intro for Dr. Scruggs, and then I'm just going to get out of the way and let her talk. So back in 2021, um, the DEI book group that we run here was reading Dr. Kendi's Stamps. And we got to the section on W.E.B. Du Bois. I thought there would have to be someone local to be able to speak about Dr. Du Bois more, with more authority than me. And I found that UMass Amherst is where Du Bois's papers are held. I contacted them and Dr. Scruggs got back to me. She spoke with the group that she spoke with the group then, and I asked her to speak again today on Dr. Du Bois' birthday. A proud daughter of Texas, she earned her doctorate in public history at UMass and Amherst. She's now an assistant professor of history at Central Connecticut State University. Her classes include 20th century U.S. history, African American history, public history, and gender and empire studies. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Scruggs and get out of the way. Sorry, I was muted. Wow. Let me try that one more time. Brad, thank you once again for the opportunity um, to talk about a subject that I enjoy, um, a subject that I feel people should know about. So for the next uh, few minutes or so, we'll talk a little bit about Du Bois. We'll talk about this man that people have seen and also talk a little bit about his local connections, um, whether it's in Western Massachusetts or his connections to, you know, little places on the other side of the state near you, near um, Wilmington called Harvard, right? So we'll talk about that, but we'll also talk about how Du Bois really had an impact on the world. So the title of my talk today will be From Massachusetts to the Masses, W.E.B. Du Bois. Let me make sure I put my thing together. All right, so of course, W.E.B. or William Edward Burkhart Du Bois. Um, the photo in the middle, we'll start with that one. That's kind of the image that a lot of us have seen of Du Bois. Um, the hairline, the mustache, the goatee, the very distinct features that we have of this man. Um, and as Brad said today would have been his birthday. He was born February 23rd, 1868 in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And he passes away August 27, 1963 in Opera, Ghana. Um, a couple of things to note, he lived to be the age of 95 and he dies the day before the March on Washington. And so in that we have, a you know, the announcement is made that Du Bois has passed. And even some of the speakers, some of those who were there have said that the ideas of Du Bois, his, his actions are what brought us here to Washington, D.C. for the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. So we can see a lot in that 95 years. We literally see through Du Bois' life this transition from literally civil war because he's born pretty much at the end of civil war to civil rights. So we see a lot that happens in nearly a century of one person's life. So I wanna start with who is Du Bois? What is his family? So I titled this one Family First. So Du Bois lives with his mother um, and his father, Alfred, and his half-brother, Adelbert, in Great Barrington, which is, of course, on the western side of the state, um, closer towards the New York state line. Um, not only that, not only is Du Bois surrounded by his parents, but he's also surrounded by his immediate family, um, his maternal family, his grandparents and uncles live in an area of town known as Egremont Plain. And the image on the left is of course a, um, an image of his mother, Mary Sylvina Berger. Um, And the image on the right is his father, Alfred Du Bois. Um, but what's interesting is that Du Bois is really surrounded by community um, at an early age in Du Bois' life, unfortunately. Um, well, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you think about it, um, his father leaves um, to pursue other opportunities, unfortunately does not return back to Great Barrington. So Mary is becomes a single mother and she is raising 
her sons with her family. And we see that later um, in Du Bois's life, they actually live with her family uh, out in the Zomont Plain from about when Du Bois is from about age two to about age six. And this is very instrumental in Du Bois's life because this is the home that Du Bois knows. This is the home that he talks about. Um, and this is the site that is preserved today um, as the Du Bois boyhood home site. So in this area, this town of Western Massachusetts, it's called Great Barrington. I say that he was cultivated by his community. So individuals in town know him as Little Willie. Uh, Great Barrington was his hometown until he goes off to college. Um, he is supported by the community. He graduates at the top of his class at Great Barrington High School. He works at the local construction site. And this is the town of Great Barrington around 1880. This is an actual map of Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And the image on the right is the Great Barrington High School class photo, right? Like everyone has a class photo. And of course we see a young William Edward Burghardt who graduates top of his class. Um, in, in the archives, we have no bad photos of Du Bois, of all the things I've seen, which I think is an interesting thing to think about. But he graduated top of his class, and his first college choice uh, was Harvard, but unfortunately at the time, that was not an option for Du Bois. So there are individuals within the community that raised funds um, for him to attend Fisk University, a historically black college and university in Nashville, Tennessee. And that of course um, is instrumental to Du Bois's ideas. And once he goes to Fisk, he graduates and then he pursues graduate study um, at Harvard. These, some of these same community members are providing recommendations for his admission to Harvard University. And once again, this whole idea of being cultivated by the community, Du Bois was one of the first African-Americans to receive a PhD from Harvard in 1895. The image on the left is his bachelor's degree um, when Du Bois went to Harvard. Um, even though he graduated from Fisk, um, they somewhat requested a reevaluation of, of his education. So therefore he went into Harvard and received a bachelor's and Du Bois, of course, prominent speaker, well-spoken, that's evidenced in letters of recommendation and just memories of those in the community about Du Bois. And of course he's appearing at one as one of the six speakers at the graduation in Harvard. Of course, once again, Du Bois on the far right, never a bad photo. So back to this whole being of the community. In the community, Du Bois is is receive is aware of inequality, um, or as I call it, ideas about inequality. So Du Bois' is a boyhood home, the one that he lived from age two to age six with his grandparents, um, is merely a few miles away from a town called Sheffield, Massachusetts, where a um, an enslaved woman by the name of Elizabeth, um, she was known as Mumbet, but um, Elizabeth Freeman seeks the legal means of procuring her freedom. In that Elizabeth Freeman there is a case that goes before uh, the state of Massachusetts in which she challenges. Um, you say that people are free and equal, does that include me? And she, um, her case, um, along with the Walker case, kind of set the standard for the, the abolition of slavery in Massachusetts. So Du Bois is very much aware of what freedom means, right? This this whole idea of freedom um, and how equality and inequality can work. And there's a particular instance um, when Du Bois is a young man. Uh, he talks about a childhood incident in which one of his visiting cards or Valentine's card, what we would call today, was declined by one of his classmates. And in that he talks about, he realizes that there is somewhat of a veil, right? There, there are these two different worlds um, for African-Americans. He talks about that in one of his most well-known books that um, is published 
the souls of black folk, um, which is the image on the right. So even in Massachusetts, he's realizing that freedom can be attained, equality can be attained, but also there are these moments of inequality. And I think that that sets a foundation for Du Bois's later works, um, his, his later acts in life. So a little bit about this, this particular work, Souls of Black. Um, this is the first edition that was published uh, in 1903. It's a series of about 14 essays that talks about the challenges and the lived experiences of African-Americans at the beginning of the 20th century, at the beginning of the 1900s. And each essay, interestingly enough, begins with lyrics or music uh, from, from a hymn or what we call African-American spirituals. And the image on the right is Du Bois's actual draft, his handwritten draft of some of these essays that appear in the work. And I think it's interesting to see what Du Bois really thought, like he's connecting these songs, he's connecting the lyrics to these experiences and he covers everything from what it was like to be a person of color and loss and sometimes these moments of joy that shows up in these particular works. And so we'll talk about just a couple of them. Um, the first one I want to talk about is uh, the first song that shows up. It's called Of Our Spiritual Strivings. Um, in this, he, of course, gives acknowledgement and nods and gives a nod to New England, right? He says that he was a little boy, right, along the Housatonic. And you can see how he gorgeously talks about nature and home and how important it is. Right. But the moment that once again, that whole idea of, of inequality happening is he talks about, of course, in the schoolhouse, he's buying these visiting cards or like I said, we would call them Valentine's. Right. The exchange was merry until one girl refused my call and refused it peremptorily with a glance. And that's when it dawned upon him that he was different from the others, that he was shut out from their world by a vast veil. And once again, we see that experience shapes uh, Du Bois's later activities um, in his life. Um, I would argue and say that moments like this is what prompts Du Bois to be one of the co-founders of, um, of an organization uh, that is in existence today. And in that same book, that same Souls of Black book, he talks about loss. He talks about his own personal loss in this instance. Um, song number 11, of the passing of the first one, um, he, he talks about in this, he talks about he fled to his wife and his child, um, away from the flickering sea into my own Berkshire Hills that sit all sadly guarding the gates of Massachusetts, right? This local, this connection to, to his home state, right? He talks about how perfect his life was and summers, you know, beside the Houston But in this, his firstborn son, his only son, um, Burkhart, which is in this image, uh, this is W.V. Du Bois, his son Burkhart and his first wife, Nina. Unfortunately, uh, Burkhart passes away of a childhood disease um, of diphtheria at the age of 18 months. And because Massachusetts is so important, to Du Bois, he says, we could not lay him here on the ground here in Georgia for the earth there is strangely red. So we bore him away to the North Pole with his flowers and his little folded hands. In the Mahewa Cemetery in Great Barrington, Massachusetts is where his son is buried. His first wife, Nina is buried. Um, du Bois has two children, uh, Burkhart and his daughter Yolande. They are buried in Massachusetts, right? So we can see this whole connection to Massachusetts, to that being home for him, to this home state, right? So we see that in his writings, um, but we'll backtrack a little bit. So in Du Bois's lived experiences in Massachusetts, we can see a connection of justice and journalism. Um, du Bois is observing local politics by attending town council meetings. Um, this, of course, is 
an image, I want to say around the 18, let me say like early, like 1860, 1870, of the town hall in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And if you drive down Main Street in Great Barrington, you can still see this building. This building is still in existence. Um, du Bois is reporting the activities of the African American community. Um, and he's, of course, uh, writing about the African American sewing circle at the Clinton AME Church, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, which is this image on the right. And I'll talk a little bit about um, the efforts for this particular building that's happening today um, and how you can participate in it. Um, du Bois serves as a local correspondent for the New York Globe and the Springfield Republican newspaper. So we see these these talents, these observations of Du Bois, and they once again will come into manifest in later acts in his life. So with that, these ideas of justice and journalism kind of combining, um, Du Bois is one of the co-founders of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in 1909. Um, du Bois serves as the first editor of the Crisis Magazine, a publication by the same organization. This organization is still um, is still vibrant today, even in 2024. Um, this is one of the covers um, from 1910 of the crisis. Of course, this is Du Bois examining one of the Crisis Magazines. Um, the image on the left is a meeting from the 1920s with Du Bois once again. I'm in the middle, never looking bad. I promise. I don't think we have any bad photos, and I mean that. Um, in the archives at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, so we see these these moments, right? Um, that happens in his home state, right? And how they really can, how he brings these ideas, and how he really can take them from Massachusetts to the masses. Um, another thing that we talk about with Du Bois that sometimes people don't think about is Du Bois has a love for the land. The way that he romantically writes about his home state. Um, we see that in, in a variety of places. Um, we see how he, quote, slips into the Bay State and past the boulders into the Egamont Plain. He talks about Great Barrington and how he was born by a golden river in the shadow of two great hills. And he talks about the river that flows nearby, flows as gently as the life stream of our town. Um, in archival records, we see Du Bois advocating for, for conservation efforts. Even in his own hometown of Great Barrington, he goes back um, after graduating and you know, like, kind of supports or encourages this campaign of, of conserving local waterways, right? We see Du Bois really as a nature lover. We can see him kind of connect with even some of the ideas of like our of conservators and founders of the Sierra Club, like John Muir, right? This whole idea of enjoying nature and being outside. And that's something that sometimes we don't think about with, with Du Bois. And he gets all this from being in his home state. Now, I talked a little bit earlier about um, his his grandparents, his maternal grandparents, um, and living in the outskirts. And so this is where he lives from age two to age six. As he writes in the Crisis Magazine, he calls it the house of the Black Birds. So of course, it's, it's maternal land. It's the land from his mother's side. Um, it belongs to the Burghards, um since the 1790s. He lives in this house from age two to age six. Um, he describes it as a house with a fireplace, a kitchen, a great room, and a loft for sleeping. Um, it tells us several things. It tells us African Americans as homeowners and landlords in the 1800s when we know that a majority of African Americans were not owning the land. They were not owning homes. They were they were working the land, but they were not owning the land. And so that that's a really big deal. And we see Du Bois has this idea. Um, but what's interesting about this is he writes about this, of course, in the 1928 edition 
of the crisis. Um, this image is a photo from 1933. Um, what's interesting is that Du Bois leaves, he graduates from Harvard, he's teaching, you know, he teaches, and he, of course, um, becomes the editor of the crisis and lives in New York City. Um, he talks about how if the drive wasn't so far, he would drive from Great Barrington to New York City. And I imagine what would his, would he listen to an audiobook? Would it be a podcast? How would he keep himself um, entertained along that drive? But um, for one of his later birthdays, the house um, is available. And so friends of his gather together and do what I call kind of a modern GoFundMe crowdsource funding and give him the land for his birthday. Because this is an important place. He's talked about it. People know that this small house out in on the Egremont Plain in Great Barrington, Massachusetts is important because it's home, it's his foundation. And so he gets it for his birthday. So we'll talk about that. Um, this, of course, is a an artist rendition of the home. We have records, we have land records, insurance that solidify that this indeed is um, is the home place um, of Du Bois. And I think of it as when think of the Wizard of Oz, right? When Dorothy thinks of home and how she feels, how she feels good about this place, and so. With the house of the Black Burkharts, his mother, his aunts, his uncles were born in the house on the land. Um, it's important to him because it's a foundation, but he also sees it as a place of safety, right? Um, when there are race riots that are happening in Atlanta in the early 1900s, he sends his family back to Great Barrington because um, he considers it a safe place. Um, as I stated earlier, his children, his first wife, Local relatives, families are buried in the Mahaley Cemetery, which is not even five miles from this particular spot. Um, and like I said, he was surrounded by family. Uh, it was a, a he said he, it was a place for people for you know for boys to play. It was a boyhood playground. It was a family compound. So to have land um, that's owned by your family. Think about your own homes, like the connection that you have to your to your home, whether it's your hometown or, or the home in where you live. You've always had those same types of feelings, those same type of ideas uh, regarding home. So we see that's important. Later, um, around 19, around 1920. Um, so as he even says, he has a sentimental desire to keep this place. So Du Bois has been writing about this, this house. And so, like I said, his friends got together and funded money. They kind of had a, a GoFundMe crowdsourcing and they gave him the house for his 60th birthday present. And he says that it was the loveliest birthday present imaginable. And of course he says this is the first home that he remembers. So in this particular slide, we have a few things. We have the blueprints, and the floor plan for the renovation of his house, or as I would call it, a historic HGTV project. And this bill is from July 20th of 1928, in which um, he is asking for masonry. And we still have a foundation of some of that masonry work at the Du Bois Boyhood home site out in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Um, and of course, we see these floor plans, like he has grand plans. He really wants this to be a place where where he can have a respite and, and be amongst nature. But also in the same area, we have individuals like Jane Walden Johnson who has a writing cabin nearby. There's evidence of African-American writers like Langston Hughes who are living or, or who vacation or, or have, who find respite in this Western Mass location. So we see this as a place of, of rest. Um, I would say that Du Bois was really a hometown kid wanting to save his home. And we see that. We see all of this evidence. Du Bois is writing to the town, asking about land deeds and all of this to, to solidify and to validate his, his homeland, right? This home space. 
for him. Um, we put that into, that has been put and documented into nominations to turn this particular place into a national, um, into a national landmark designation and into a historic site. Um, unfortunately, Du Bois begins these home innovations and due to, uh, by this time we get to about the 1930s. So by the time we get to the Great Depression, um, unfortunately he's unable to finish the project. So um, unfortunately the land becomes available and um, is no longer in within the uh, the Burghardt uh, and the Burghardt Du Bois thing. But um, we have a renovation or preservation effort that happens in the late 1950s, early 1960s, in which we have a real estate developer and an educator. Um, they, once again, do another crowdsourcing GoFundMe um, effort in which we have individuals like Aaron Copeland contributing and purchasing the land and eventually turning it into somewhat of a park. Um, it eventually receives a National Historic Landmark designation and becomes a place that is maintained by the University of Massachusetts in um, which you can actually visit the site. And so I'll kind of wrap this up with, you can visit this site, this home. It's in Massachusetts. Um, literally, you can come down the Mass Pike um, and come to Great Barrington and see this place. It is the Du Bois Boyhood Home site. It is maintained by the University of Massachusetts Amherst, um, being that the University of Massachusetts is um, the Commonwealth institution. Um, we see ourselves as, as the conservator of this place. Not only does the University of Massachusetts um, maintain the boys site, but we also on our campus library have the, the special collection, the Rob Cox uh, special collection in University Archives in which we have the Du Bois papers. We have nearly 100,000 items in that collection that have been digitized. So you can see them virtually, or you can even go visit in person and look at Du Bois's firsthand accounts of his souls of black folk, um, a lock of hair from, um, from his son and the results of digs that have been done by anthropology and archeology span department. Um, in which we have located items that have been on the way. So we see that as we, the University of Massachusetts kind of sees ourselves as, as kind of the conservator of, of the state's son, of a son of the state of Massachusetts. Um, Self-guided tours are available. There's interpretive signage out there as well. And if you ever want to find additional resources, about Du Bois, you can, of course, visit the Du Bois Center at UMass Amherst on the campus. There's archival material. There are moments of outreach. Um, one that I would suggest is Breakfast with Du Bois, in which every Monday there is a Zoom meeting in which we dissect a work of Du Bois. We take a work out of the collections and we discuss it as a group. Um, I want to say we are in the high 100s of that. Um, we started during the pandemic, um, around the pandemic, and we've been going ever since. So you can definitely visit um, and support the Du Bois Center at UMass Amherst. Or the other additional resources is the Du Bois Freedom Center. So that Clinton AME Church uh, that I showed you a few slides back is being transformed into a visitor center in which there will be exhibits and tours kind of telling the story of Du Bois, but not just Du Bois, but African-Americans in the Berkshires, African-Americans in Massachusetts. And so therefore we can have those opportunities. Um, and of course, these are websites in which you can check out and support and visit. And for me to be able to, based on, on my moments out at the Boyhood home site, um, walking in the woods and discussing Du Bois, to introduce people that may not have ever learned or knew about Du Bois or they may have known about Du Bois by being a member of the NAACP or reading one of his works or seeing his connection to disciplines like history or sociology is always a pleasure. And 
also let people know that this man that founded one of one of the most well-known social justice organizations for African Americans was born in Massachusetts. He really is a regular person. And to connect him to those ideas have been a pleasure and indeed a privilege and guides my work even um, as a professor across the state in Connecticut um, and just in the work that I do, whether it's public history or US history or African-American history. And lastly, I just wanna thank the Wilmington Library for this opportunity, Brad, for letting me uh, talk lovingly about um, some of the work that I've done. Of course, the Du Bois Center and the Du Bois Library at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, the Upper Housatonic Valley National Heritage Area in which the Du Bois Boyd home site is not only just a part of the University of Massachusetts, but it's also affiliated um, through the National Park Service and the Du Bois Freedom Center out in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, in which they are helping to tell the story of not just Du Bois, but those who advocated for Du Bois um, in, in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Um, of course, any questions, all of the social media things um, to follow me via email, X, formerly known as Twitter, Instagram, those options are available. And once again, thank you all. Oh, thank you so much. That was that was awesome. I think that I always forget how good a writer he was. I read Souls of Black Folk years ago, and it's it's just his it's it holds up not unfortunately topic wise but also like the, his writing style is very elegant i mean it's it's kind of highbrow but he went to have it what do you want <laughs> well, not only that but du bois writes fiction right? yeah like, people don't know that like he writes fiction he's writing short stories and plays and poems and you know once again you think highbrow harvard no he's writing about these experiences and you know yep. you can find all that in yeah collections it's fantastic. Um, do you do you know if the, the his papers can you read the, any of his crisis? Do they have any of the crisis issues at the papers? Some center? of the crisis issues are available. Um, I know that we should be able you should be able to access those. If not, there are always Du Bois scholars <laughs> that <laughs> guide you to other places. Sure. Um, so we, do you have time for a few? We have a few questions. Sure, yeah. sure. So Nancy asked, did you say that the home was demolished or is there a homestead there? So the homestead site, you can still see, for example, when you go to the home site, uh, a majority of it is demolished. But um, the University of Massachusetts, we've done, we've been doing archaeological digs out there since the 1980s. So we have definitely cordoned it off. Um, if you go out to the site, we have put out like a platform in which when you stand on that platform, based on the digs and based on architectural plans, that's the actual living room. And there is a foundation for the fireplace, right? So that masonry receipt that I showed, we still have like, that is available. So you can still physically go out. And some people, when they go out, they, they feel a sense of to stand on the site, right? Where Du Bois once stood. Um, and to see people react to that and leave small things, they may leave small flowers or, you know, or a piece of, of the souls of Black folk. It's amazing what, what we collect, right? How people memorialize this particular space and thinking, okay, or, you know, they, this is the man that was one of the co-founders of the NAACP. I'm an NAACP member, right? And to stand in the place, like you feel like you're connecting with Du Bois on that. That's great. Yeah, I would, um, we have a few more questions, but I want to <laughs> jump on that. And I want to strongly urge everybody here to go out there, go out to the site, go out to the papers, Ooh. take a selfie with yourself. Like, yes, this is Black History Month, but there's no reason the Black history can't be celebrated outside of February. Mm -hmm. So next month or something, take it, or when the weather gets warmer, take a trip out there and, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, post a selfie or something. And just keep keep the conversation going. I, I would urge that. Um, another question we have is, why was Du Bois in Ghana when he died in 95? 
Oh, the it could be a topic, right? It could be another talk. <laughs> That's a whole nother talk, right? So, uh, Du Bois is complicated. Um, with that, Du Bois, there was a letter that Du Bois wrote, um, that said basically to the effect he believes in things like workers' rights, protection, common sense things. However, that was written at a time in which the United States is recently coming out of the McCarthyism era. So the letter was written to the Communist Party of the United States. Um, and so there was um there there, there was some some controversy around that. Uh Du Bois is invited to Ghana um to at the invitation of President Nkrumah. Um Ghana is coming out of um, colonial rule. So who better than a Harvard trained historian, right, to tell the history of of Africa. Um, so unfortunately, at the time that, that he goes to, uh, to Ghana, um, his citizenship uh, is challenged. And so therefore, he is unable to return to the United States. Um, and so of course, he does pass away once again at the age of 95 uh, in Ghana and where in which where he and his second wife, uh, Shirley, are are interred. Yeah. Um, speaking of family does he have any surviving descendants yes he does oh, good. <laughs> his daughter Yolande uh as a matter of fact um Du Bois's granddaughter uh Du Bois uh Du Bois Williams was uh passed away within the past couple of years and she's buried um out at the Mahewa Cemetery in Great Barrington and there are there are grandchildren and to meet and I've met some of you know some of the grandchildren of Du Bois Williams. So, you know, these are like Du Bois's great, you know, grandchildren and great, great grandchildren. And to see them come into a collection, right? To come into the collection at UMass and be like, oh my gosh, like I know about Du Bois, but this is like, this is my ancestor. And they are often um, coming to Massachusetts um, and even going to Ghana and they're still involved and want to tell the story of their ancestor. I mean, I would do. <laughs> <Yeah>. Sure. <laughs> uh, so Barbara asks, it appeared that Du Bois was the only African-American student in his high school class. Were there barriers to education for African-American students or there were not many other students of color? I would say that there were not that many students of color. The African-American population in Great Barrington is was, and I would dare to say even is still less than 5%. Um, once again, Du Bois was, was touted for, for his intellect, right? We see that in the writings, in some of the recommendations. He is smart. He speaks well. He is, you know, of course, he's sitting on a town council meeting. So we can definitely see where that intellect builds, this, this intellectual curiosity mm -hmm. um, builds in Du Bois, and that's Foster. Um, so in that, you know, we see Du Bois as as an intellectual. He's always been lauded as as an intellectual. And I think the I don't really think there were barriers. Um, once again, see, you know, for the most part, Great Barrington at the time was so was somewhat progressive. Like they knew the African Americans in the town. His mother shows up on um on church records within the town, right? And like I said members of the town or, or having a GoFundMe and paying for <laughs> tuition at Fisk. Um, they, they feel that Fisk was the, was the best institution for him. Um, being that he was a person of color in Harvard was not exactly uh, progressive, I guess, <laughs> in their admissions policy at the time. Yeah. Uh, do we know how his ancestors ended up in Great Barrington? So, um, his ancestors um, were brought from New York um, through their enslaver. And so that's how they made it from New York to Great Barrington. Gotcha. Uh, let's one more is, has your group read the discuss the novel Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois? I have started reading it. Um, it it's a good work. It <laughs> no, it, it, because once again, it explores... Du Bois in so many ways, because sometimes it depends on, depending on who you ask, some people are like, oh, it's Du Bois. It's, you know, the man who began the NAACP yeah. or it's Du Bois, the sociologist. 
But, you know, it, there are these ways in which we look at Du Bois. He's a sociologist. Um, another book suggestion, um, in addition to the novel, um, there, like Du Bois is a sociologist, right? So he's presenting numbers. Like he has these gorgeous, what we would consider modern day infographics, right? <laughs> um, that, you know, is a display of the work that he's doing when he's asking about like, what is the education like for people in certain places in certain states? Um, he has an exhibition of African-American photos that he sent, that he takes to Paris, right? And he's putting on a global stage that despite what you may have heard or what you may have thought, African-Americans are brilliant people, right? So we see him definitely as an advocate for that um, throughout his life's work. Uh, as a sociologist and a historian and as an advocate um, through the NAACP and even later in his life, we definitely see that whole trajectory of Du Bois advocating uh, for excellence and just showing that, that people are great mm -hmm. and advocating for the rights of, of all. You know, we see Du Bois even advocating for women's Right. And so we see Du Bois really is one that is a supporter of democracy and justice for everyone everywhere. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. I love how you can make, you know, infographics, right? You can make the <laughs> connection between what he was doing a hundred and some odd years ago to today. And that, that's so powerful. So I love how you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it makes it more, it makes it real, you know, you can put the connection to it. It's, mm -hmm. and that's why I asked you, because there's so many things that we could have talked about about oh, boys, but making that Massachusetts connection because we're here in Massachusetts, um, I think it sinks in for me. I can't speak to anybody, exactly. everybody else, but because it like sinks in for me when you make that personal connection, you know? Right, because hometowns are important, right? Like we think about like, what do we learn from our hometown? Like, where do we take those values? What do we take those moments? And when I was, was doing tours out on the tour, I was like, Du Bois is just simply a hometown kid with hometown values that yeah. he takes out into the larger world. Yeah. So I don't think we have any other questions here. I'll give it a second in case somebody's typing something, but um, I do want to thank you so much for taking your time. I know I got you in the middle of a semester here, so um, I appreciate you being able to take the time out here. And um, I think it was, it was great. So um, yeah. So thank you so much. No, and I will be sending out the links to everybody for the attendees. So like if you didn't click any of the links in the in the chat, I'll send those out. And um, so you can visit virtually or as I said before, please take the time out when uh, the weather is better and go go visit these sites. Go physically be there because physically there's something about being in a physical place when you're thinking or reading or looking at history. It's it's powerful. It's very powerful. So if nobody has anything else, I will let everybody go. I know that uh, this was like, it might be lunchtime for some people. So you got 15 more minutes if if you have an hour lunch to enjoy yourself. But uh, once again, thank you so much, Dr. Scruggs. And everyone uh, have a good weekend. Thank you, Brad. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Bye.